Hello, Sandra. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. And yourself? Not too bad. Good, uh, good. Good, good. So, uh, so how would you sum up the season that you first had? Would you be good? Well, so far, very strong. Uh, lying second in the championship with the most wins this year. Uh, five wins so far. Still got a round to go, obviously, in Abu Dhabi. Fingers crossed I can uh, bring the championship home. So, before the season, where were you personally expecting to be? I mean, did you have belief in yourself that you could, could win? Well, it's, it's crazy. Before, before the, uh, the season started, I mean, I was going to Australia with, with Mercedes, not knowing what I was going to drive. I found out on the Saturday evening when I was in Australia for the, for the first Grand Prix of the year that I would be taking part in GP2 this year with a brand new team in Russian time. So I didn't really know what to expect, I was thrilled to be racing, but uh, very much going into the unknown. I hadn't driven a GP2 car for well over a year, hadn't driven anything for probably four or five months. Uh, so kind of you know, thrown into the deep end as it were, however it's, uh, it's worked out pretty well. So were you a bit rusty when you first got in and was doing your first few laps then? Or? Yeah, especially the first couple of laps was very difficult. Uh, but if you're corrected, we were the quickest in that session. So it wasn't, it wasn't too bad. But uh, I'd never been to Malaysia before. Mm. I had a, an injured wrist and uh, hadn't driven a GP2 car or anything for quite a long time. So it was, uh, it was very tricky, but we got there. Um, in Malaysia, you had a slight incident with Jakarta. He forced you off track. How was that from your perspective? Um, I was. It was bizarre. Mm. It was. It was unexpected and bizarre. However, I've come to realise in this championship this year, particularly, that there are two specific people that tend to do these things quite a lot, mm. um, and kind of take that for granted now that that's how they will behave if you're around them on the racetrack. I take it that will leave names. Names out of it. Absolutely. Uh, you won at Monaco this year, but wasn't it not for the second straight year that you won there? It's what is it about Monaco that you know brings your drive out to its best? I don't know. I, I really enjoy the whole atmosphere. I love driving that circuit. I like the fact that uh, I feel comfortable there. I feel comfortable with the walls being able to push right to its limit. Mm -hmm. I've qualified on pole twice there. Got many fastest laps and won twice there. So it is a good circuit for me. I won it before against Shaw Bianchi in World Series by Renault where we were nose to tail for 37 or 38 laps. Mm -hmm. uh, but we were 40 seconds ahead of third place. This year I won by 25 seconds to second place, so a big win this year. So on a track like Monaco, because you won by such a big deal, you must have been pushing it quite, quite a bit. Um, I was actually stroking at home fairly gently for the last 15 laps of the race. However, we were still able to pull away from everybody else, yeah. which was a nice feeling. Uh, there was a crash on Turn 1, if I'm not mistaken, which involved about 14 cars. Did that not help you at all? or what actually um, your it, did, it did help me, however, there was some major damage to my car as well, which is why I also had to be quite careful. Um, there was some internal gearbox damage as well when the car was being taken back to the GP2 paddock after the race, it actually broke down. Yeah. So uh, I think one or two more gear shifts during the race yeah. and I wouldn't have finished. So I was quite fortunate. So what was it like to win your home GP? Amazing, amazing. To win at Silverstone in front of my home crowd um, in front of everybody, you know, friend, friends and family, was was just awesome. I've got to say, but to lead it pretty much from start to finish as well and command the race from from the offset felt very very good. The next race, as you said, is in Abu Dhabi. There have been criticisms of the track that it's not a driver friendly one and main drivers don't like it. What's your personal opinion on the track? I quite enjoy it. I think it's quite a good track. It's um, it's kind of two tracks made into one. You've got the first couple of sectors that are quite wide and open, long straights uh, and a couple of chicanes. Then you've got a tight and twisty bit to, to finish the track where thermal degradation comes into play. For sure it's going to be very hot. Mm. For sure at the beginning of the weekend it's going to be very sandy. The facilities are first class. I don't think there's any track in the world that can state that they have as good a facility as Abu Dhabi. Maybe the new Silverstone, uh, maybe some of the other tracks in the east. but. Uh, it is, it is a stunning facility, I've got to say. So what about the pit lane where you actually go down and underneath the track, there's also quite a few people who aren't a, a, a big fan of that. Would you say that there's another way to, to make that pit lane? Or would you say? Uh, I think it adds character to the track, and I think that it's an opportunity for people to lose time coming out of the pits, people that aren't prepared to push out of the tunnel on cold tyres mm -hmm. uh, through that little corner. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the difference between maybe getting out in the lead and not. 
What about the potential track in New Jersey? Have you been there at all and actually seen their plans? Or? I haven't been there, no. I've seen the plans. It looks very exciting. They tend to do great jobs uh, at these Formula 1 tracks. Most of them are actually quite exciting to drive. Uh, whether they, they look it or not on TV, I, you know, it, it's, not, it's not for me to say, but to drive, most of them are pretty exciting. Uh, so what has been your favourite track to drive this year? I mean, my personal favourite is Spa. What's your favourite track to go on? Well, Formula One is blessed with the fact that it can choose the best tracks. Um, I've never been to Singapore before, very much enjoyed that. Uh, I think I've won at the best tracks so far this year. I was disappointed not to win at Monza, came second there. Uh, in my opinion, should have won had it not been for a poor pit stop. But, uh, you know, to win at Bahrain, Silverstone, uh, Singapore, Spa and Monaco, I mean, those are, those are five pretty cool tracks in my opinion. So your team this year was Russian time. Are you happy that there could be a Russian Grand Prix on the uh, calendar next year? I think it's good for, for Russia, for sure. Having Vitaly Petrov in, uh, in Formula 1 opened their eyes to, to Formula 1 a little bit. Having a team as well has opened their eyes even more. Uh, and for sure they're going to get far more exposure now. They've built two tracks actually in Russia. Uh, one that I've driven at in World Series by Renault and the new Sochi track as well. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to going there. Maybe I can get to drive it. You said that you work for Mercedes as a test driver, third driver. What, what do your weekends involve? Well, I go to every single race as backup basically for Lewis and Nico in case they were unwell or unable to drive for whatever reason. I could jump in the car and do the best job I can. Uh, I'm prepared mentally, physically, uh, and also I've done all the preparation work in the simulator that's prepared me for every eventuality. How many hours weekly might you actually spend in a uh, simulator? Well, I'll be there at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning uh, <laughs> until 7 o'clock at night and uh, also Thursday as well. So, you know, twice, three times a week I'll be on the simulator working on the next event or the event after. Also working on a lot of 2014 stuff at the moment as well as you can imagine. So when you get called to a race, you were called to Japan, Korea, when there's no GP tour on, is it a bit of a boring weekend sometimes? I might drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> it seems understandable because staring at timesheets all day might be a tad boring. Well, I feel a part of the team because I've done all the preparation work. I feel like what I've done is going into Lewis and Nico's efforts. So I will, you know, listen intently to the radio, um, maybe make some comments in the debriefs about uh, Curse deployments or ratios or, or, or whatever it might be, for example, on the car. So I do feel a part of the team, even though I'm not necessarily doing very much. So what are the engineers looking from you when you do the young driver's tests and test runs throughout the year? Mainly to obviously be quick in consistency. You know, they, they don't want someone to do one lap quick and then one lap slow, then one lap okay. They want repetitiveness so that they can look at the data and see a consistent gain or um, or not, as the case may be, with a new component. You know, they've done all this aero work in the tunnel, um, CFD work. Um, they might think that it's worth a couple of points of downforce, a new, a new component on the car. So I've got to prove that that part works or doesn't work. So it's up to me to be consistent and quick with, uh, with the car that they give me. The steering wheel in a Formula 1 car is a lot more complicated than the GP. Do you think they're too complicated or...? Uh, you, you, you know, people that are watching this at home might look at a Formula One steering wheel and go, "What the, what the hell are all these buttons?" <laughs> but for me, it's um, how can I put it? It's a little bit like if if anybody is in their road car and they want to change the track on on the stereo, um, then they want to turn the volume up and do the windscreen wiper, but they also want to turn right at the same time. Mm. You know, doing all those things is very very easy if you know your road car, I know my steering wheel. So it, it's just like those controls, but at 200 miles an hour. Obviously because it's Mercedes, it is a big team. What's it like being part of a big team? You know? yeah, amazing. Um, you know, I've, I've learned a lot over the years with Nico, Lewis and, and Michael Schumacher. I've, I've learned off three brilliant drivers, also some brilliant engineers as well, some of the best in, in the business. Um, being. And uh, under Ross's, uh, you know, banner is is a pretty cool place to be. He's he's been there and done it all. Uh, same with Jeff Willis. Same with Bob Bell, Aldo Costa. Um, they've all been there and done it. So it's pretty cool to learn off those guys. Um, and I feel ready now to make the next step in my career, which should be to race in a Formula One race.
So when did you first decide, I want to do racing, you know, I, I want to start with coming and... Oh God, I, I mean, I started watching it with my mum and dad when I was three or four years old. Um, I'd be, you know, rushing around the living room on a little, little go-kart, um, pedal little kart thing. Right. Um, you know, when I was a kid, when I was eight years old, I went for my first ever karting experience at Silverstone for my birthday. Uh, and the instructor actually wrote on the, on the note, you know, they, they give you like an evaluation sheet. And they said, I, oh, you know, you've got some talent. One day Williams will come looking for you. Mm. And about 10 years after that, I got a phone call from, from Williams saying, would you like to test our Formula 1 cars? Mm. So that was the uh, start of the dream being realised. Mm. So when did you get your first go kart then? First car that I actually ever owned, Gary Paffett made, <laughs> uh, along with Luke Hines, and I was 10 years old. It was a little zip cadet car. So how did you get to where you are now? What, what level did you... Well, firstly, it took a lot of hard work, dedication. There's been some highs, there's been some lows, and you have to get through some really hard times. Um, but no, I started karting when I was 10, and you, you work your way up through the kind of karting ladder as it were it was different back then it was called uh, a cadet then yamaha jika ica and you go through british and european championships and then you decide that you're old enough and you want to move on to, to single seater categories i went into formula bmw then i went into formula renault formula 3 gp2 mm -hmm. and since then i've been uh, doing gp2 world series and gp2 again who are your influences then who kind of got you into driving I mean, if you just watched it when you were three, would it... I mean, the, the main influences on my life so far have been my mum and dad and my managers mm -hmm. currently who have been able to help and fund me all the way through. But in terms of, uh, like, heroes, I think, is what you mean. Um, yeah. I mean, I've worked with one of them, Michael. Um, you know, growing up, he was, he was the man to beat. You know, he was winning everything. Everybody was saying F1 was boring. But he took that Ferrari team to a new level, along with Ross Braun. And I've, I've worked with both those guys, so not only are they uh, heroes to me, I've been lucky enough to, to work under the same roof as them and become friends with them. So um, if you were going to go on holiday, who would you take, Nico, Michael or Lewis? It's hard. I mean, I get on with all of them really, really well. I reckon we should just all go off and, and have a, a, a party together. That'd be cool. <laughs> so do you feel that you still need to prove yourself to Formula 1 teams, or do you think that you've done enough? Um, the proof that I want to do now is obviously proof that I can race well. Um, I can test well, obviously. I believe that I will be able to race well given the opportunity. Are GP2 standards as high as they have ever been because it is the, the cream of the crop going into for, Formula 1? I'd, I'd say that the, the standards in GP2 are very, very high this year. You know, the guys, the guys at the front, especially, are very, very quick, mm. as they are in every championship you do. You can only beat the people that you're up against, and normally, the people you're up against are, are very strong. You know, you've got the likes of uh, Felipe Nasa, James Collado, um, Mark Sorokson, Fabio Lima, um, to name a couple, you know, who are very, very strong. And many F1 teams are looking at all of us as potential candidates for seats. Well, there, there will be seats available next year. A lot of GP2 drivers obviously going to Formula 1, Adam Erdo, Grosjean Perez, there's, there's plenty you can name. Where do, you, do you feel like you have a good enough chance to get into one of these teams? I feel, yeah. I, I don't see any reason why not. I, I believe that with what I've done over the last two or three years in a uh, senior single-seater category, mm -hmm. um, that I've done enough to prove that I can, I can cope with Formula One, you know. Um, not only on, on track, but off track as well. I believe that I'm mentally stable enough to, to cope with all the pressures that come with it but also deliver on the track as well. So with your chances going to Formula 1, something which bugs me in Formula 1 is there seems to be a lot of drivers who are bringing a lot of money to the teams and that's how they're getting their seat. Do you feel that this is a problem? Um, I think it will be a problem in the future. I don't necessarily think there's a problem now, but when the likes of Fernando Alonso, uh, Kimi Raikkonen, uh, Jensen Button, Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg, uh, when all the big names are gone, we might be left with uh, a problem where everybody coming in is not necessarily the best drivers in the world anymore. It's, it's guys that have paid in the first place to get in because they can. Uh, I think that um, that would be a, a very sad situation for Formula One to be in. Let's just hope that in the future uh, the financial state does improve and that we can see the best 22, 24 drivers on the grid. See, the problem is, like, the most obvious driver who's not there at the moment is uh, Kobayashi. 
uh, that he was not there because of money. But if Formula One isn't available to you, would you consider maybe going to America and doing IndyCar at all? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. I think that that's the pinnacle in, in America. They look like great cars, they get some great attendances. Um, so I definitely think that if, if F1 was not an opportunity, the likes of DTM and IndyCar would be, uh, would be just as appealing, really. Mm. Well, Mercedes are supposed to be opening up two new cars, I did believe, to compete with Audi? Potentially. Yeah, potentially. potentially. We'll leave that as speculation. Absolutely. Do you think now that, that, that there would be a big chance for you to earn your stripes there? We will see. Only time will tell. Because someone like Paul DeResta did earn his stuff in DTM first. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. You mentioned the thing with Schumacher maybe getting a bore in. Is Formula One maybe now going down the same path with Vettel? Or or the Germans just very good? Uh, well, well, I didn't ever consider it to be boring. Mm. You know, just because somebody's at the top of their game winning constantly and they, they, they've got the car working well around them doesn't necessarily mean for me that it's boring. It means that you're watching something working very well. You're watching something great take place. And you're kind of witnessing the same at the moment with Seb. Seb has uh, taken this car to a new level. He works exceptionally hard and, and Red Bull are doing a great job. However, uh, we at Mercedes are pushing really, really hard to try and catch them. So how will the new rule changes in Formula 1, because we're dropping two P6 engines, how will that affect Mercedes next year, do you think? So how will it affect the whole Formula 1 field? Uh, yeah, for sure. It's going to affect things quite considerably. The whole uh, power source is going to be extremely different. Um, with that, you've got a couple of new chassis. We're going to have a different tyre tire structure, obviously, to cope with the fact that there's going to be probably four to five times the amount of torque going through the, re the rear axle. So um, it is going to be very, very different. Without maybe bashing Pirelli too much, do you think there's been an issue with tyres this year? Or? It's been disappointing to see so many issues with some of the F1 tyres. In GP2, we've experienced no problems. Um, so that's been fine, but the stresses that a Formula 1 tyre go under are much, much higher than a GP2 car. You've got to remember that they're going through corners quite a bit quicker than us through, due to their aerodynamic ability uh, and the power that they have in comparison to GP2. Um, but yeah, carcasses, you know, you know, tyre actually ripping, ripping itself apart is, is not ideal. Uh, it adds a spectacle to Formula 1 though, so as a team, yes, it's very disappointing when that happens. But for spectators, I think that uh, it, it probably is quite exciting. Not for not for the teams, though. Yeah. So have they not answered the brief which was set to them, which was to make Formula One more, more exciting for, for fans? Yeah, I think so. I think they definitely have. If that was the brief that they were genuinely given, mm. then I think that they have changed Formula One for the good. Uh, yeah. you, we've got a tyre that drivers have to manage. It's not necessarily the most exciting for us because we can't push to 100%. When you're watching those guys driving on the Sundays, they're not pushing, absolutely giving it everything. We're having to drive to a target time in order to look after, look after the tyre, and that's what Formula 1 is about now. Who can look after the tyre the best, the fastest? So, um, you are a very quick British driver. I hope so. Yeah. Why do you own a tortoise? <laughs> because I think <laughs> that it's ironic, the fact that I try and drive the quickest I possibly can, going of hundreds of miles an hour. Yet my little Linford, the tortoise, uh, moves as slow <laughs> as humanly possible to get anywhere. But, you know, he's a good little pet. I don't really take him for runs or anything with me because he's uh, not particularly good at running. So, uh, uh, apart from racing, which you're very good at, what are your other I interests then? Um, apart from as well the tortoise? Yeah, well, obviously, I, I, I live in Surrey at the moment. I've got a great group of friends here, um, Duncan Tappy being one of them. I was his best man at his wedding and we uh, were constantly out on the bikes or in the gym or playing golf or doing stuff together when I'm available. It's quite hard this year though with, with free time, with, with my calendar. Uh, if I'm not with him, him then I'm chilling with Will Stevens, Ollie Milroy, all these, all these guys. We kind of grew up together and went to Sandown Kart Club when we were very young. We've kind of grown up with racing together so it's really nice that we've stayed friends uh, and uh, still do stuff together. One thing I did want to ask about is the charity group Halo, I do believe it's called, and you gave out some V50, V100 awards, I do believe they're called. Can you maybe like, tell me a bit more about what they do as an well, organisation? Halo is a fantastic organisation. It's a charity that I've been supporting now for uh, four years or three years, I think, now. Um, it's basically a support unit for youths with learning disabilities. So, so guys from the ages between, I think it's 14 to, to 32, 
um, with with learning difficulties with autism, um, Down syndrome, and autistic people. Um, you know, it's a it's a fantastic charity where I feel like I can give something back to my kind of local community. These youths have not had the opportunities that I've had in life. I get to do something fairly amazing with mine. And this is an opportunity so that they can prove just how amazing they are. Um, they can, with the charity, improve their lifestyle and hopefully go out there and live the most normal life that they can and enjoy it. Well, keep up the good work with that. Thank you. Well, I think I only have one more question. If you was the F1 star in a racing class car, could you go quickest? Of course. Of course. You've got to believe in your ability, right? Yeah. yeah exactly. Well, I'm lighter than all the rest, so yeah, I've got a weight advantage. Okay. If Jeremy Clarkson wants to give me that chance, <laughs> I'm more than happy to try and display it. Okay, well, I think I am happy. Yes. Brilliant. Thank anyway, thank you very much indeed. Right.